welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we're happy to be back to answer all your gardening questions. You can contact us by dialing 1-800-676-5446 or you can email us your questions and pictures. That's byf at unl.edu. Please tell us as much as you can about your issue, including where you live. Do not forget to check us out on our YouTube channel. Make sure you like our Facebook fan page. So, you may notice that we are not broadcasting from our traditional set. Instead, our studio is in the process of getting some much needed upgrades. For more information about studio renovations and the capital campaign launched to support the project, visit nebraskapublicmedia.org slash imagine. And we can't wait for you to see it later this season. All right, so we start the round with questions. And Kyle, this is your first round this year. Yep. Uh, you have two pictures on this first one. Uh, this is a Lincoln viewer, and uh, interestingly enough, on these, her dad says these were all dead in a circle about three feet in diameter on his east-facing second-story patio. They're, they're, they're bees of some sort. His house back does back up to a greenway, and no idea where they came from, they were all dead. He also said it looked like they had stingers on their head, and it was very creepy in her mind. So what's the deal on that? What yeah. do you think? Well, this is pretty cool. So they look like carpenter bees. <clears throat> and uh, carpenter bees are, you know, they're pretty early uh, emergers in, in the spring. So they're, they're coming out this time of year. Um, and, you know, as the name implies, they, they tunnel into, into wood. The females will excavate galleries, and they, you know, partition... Uh, galleries in there um, or cells and then that's where individual larvae will develop in there um, and so at the end of the year in the fall um, they overwinter as adults and they like to go back into those same galleries that they developed in to spend the winter and so you'll get a bunch of bees in those galleries um, and there's naturally some die off over the winter and so as the ones further back that, that survived, as they're trying to get out, they sometimes have to push out a bunch <laughs> of dead bees in front of them and you get a little pile of of, uh, of dead carpenter bees. So I think if, if they were to kind of look up immediately above that area, they'd probably find a nice uh, round hole in, in some wood somewhere. Um, they're not really, you know, they're excellent pollinators. They're native, um, not, they don't really cause a lot of, um, you know, structural damage to wood. So I don't worry about them too much. Um, you can, you know, if you, if you want to, um, you know, try to keep them out of there again, you can plug up that hole with like a dowel, glue it in. And then you would need to like seal it somehow with um, you know a seal or paint or something over to kind of discourage them from using it again. Um, but really, they're you know they're good native pollinators. All right, excellent. Uh, you have two pictures on the next one, Kyle. This is uh, also a Lincoln viewer, and she says, not sure what is going on with this tree. Should they be doing anything about it? And it's doing this all over the tree trunk. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what it is, I guess. I think it's a peach. Okay, peach, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so this is gamosis that, you know, certainly happens quite a bit on, on several different um, stone, uh, stone fruit trees. So probably something like a peach tree borer or lesser peach tree borer. Um, peach tree borers do prefer um, really down close to the soil line or just below the soil. So since this is higher up, it, it might be lesser peach tree borer. Um, and they more like or more commonly attack um, around, you know, areas of, of injury um, you know, where there's, you know, either been some infection or, or pruning injury, something like that before. So um, that might be something to look into if there's been pruning that, um, you know, maybe uh, has, has led to some issues there. Um, otherwise, you know, treating for these, um, it depends on, on which one you're dealing with. There's slightly different uh, time for when they're active. Lesser uh, peach tree borers are active a little bit earlier, um, but you can monitor f for uh, their flight time with uh, pheromone traps for both species. Um, that will kind of help you get timing down. Uh, so when you know when they're laying those eggs, you would treat the bark and you want something that kind of has a, a good residual, um, a contact insecticide that you would spray on that bark. So I think um, both permethrin and carbaryl are, are um, labeled for, uh, for, for fruit trees um, and have pretty good residual, so would be, would be options for that. All right, great, thanks Kyle. All right, Matt, your first appearance this time too. 
This is a Bluffton, Ohio viewer who found us on the web and has uh, what he believes is a grassy weed that grows in ever-growing circles, starts smaller, then grows to five feet or more. It's a bluegrass lawn. He, he's wondering, is it nimble will or wire stem muley? And they're in about our growing zone. So what do we think this is? Yeah, the, I don't know. Looking at the samples, it kind of looks like it is a bluegrass. So it could be maybe a rough bluegrass, which is kind of a cousin to uh, Kentucky bluegrass. And it, it is a lime, lime or green, I guess, if you were looking at those patches. And it tends to green up and do really well in the spring. And then when you get to the summer, it kind of dies out because it kind of grows on top of itself by stolons and gets kind of wiry. Uh, so that might be rough bluegrass. I couldn't quite tell by the sample close up. I might need an actual sample to look at it. Um, but by looking at it, that's kind of what it seems like when there's those lime green colors. Or it could even be, you know, a different variety of Kentucky bluegrass that's just off color. Uh, but if it does die out in the summer, it probably is that uh, rough bluegrass. And for controlling that, there's really no uh, way to kill it without using Roundup. Uh, there's no um, selective way to take it out of bluegrass. So you'd have to kill that patch probably multiple times and then reseed into it or bring in some sod. But definitely not nimble will, which would no, be nim close yeah. to green. Yeah. Nimble will would yeah. still be greening up and you'd see a lot of brown on top. All right, all right. Um, let's see, you have three on this next one and we had this last week too, but we might as well do it again. This is a Lincoln viewer, vigorous plant re and he's saying it resembles poison hemlock. He's not sure. <clears throat> Growing on a site where the soil is very rich in an area with morning sun, dense shade in the afternoon and evening, seems to spread. He pulled up a lot of it and uh, he sent us some pretty yeah. good pictures. Yeah, actually. by the pictures yeah. looking at it, it, it does look like poison hemlock and I would be pretty positive that's what it is by uh, looking at the stems as well. I mean, uh, if you cut those open, they're probably hollow. Uh, it has a kind of a taproot. It can be hard to pull out, so you break it off a lot of times. So you can dig those out uh, if there's not too many of them. Otherwise, now is the time to control them with the uh, herbicide because they're young and they'd be easier to control than you wait. They grow really fast. And you have to uh, protect your skin, is that correct? Yeah, it can be <laughs> uh, cause red lesions, I guess, if you get the oils on you from the, the plant. All right. So Thanks, be careful, man. use some gloves. All right. Dennis. Hi. <laughs> so your first one is uh, a viewer who is first off, she's from Blair and she is so glad we're back. She's a, she's a loyal one. It's an autumn blaze maple. It was planted two years ago. She's wondering what caused the damage. She said not a wabbit because it's about three feet off the ground. Looks like tooth marks. She doesn't think it's a deer. She wants to know what happened and how does she keep it from happening again? Yeah, it's hard to say how wide these are, but it's gonna be one of two things. If it's not a deer scraping, then it's a tree squirrel, a fox squirrel. And being a maple, a fox squirrel, just under that, you know, Camden is gonna be very sweet. So usually fox squirrels go for horizontal branches, but in this case, they went for a vertical. So if you can't, you know, if it looks like teeth marks that are a quarter inch, um, then it's probably a squirrel. If it looks like scrapes that are wider, and if that's a foot wide scrape, then it could be deer um, antlers. So. And anything to do in e either case? Either, well, both cases, just putting a wire, you know, around it, make sure it's about an inch or two diameter bigger than the tree, so you're not girdling the tree but just have it go up ab above that and have it so there's only about an inch between the tree and your fencing. And you can use, you know, just hardware cloth or any kind of fencing. All right, excellent. Uh, you have two picks on this next one. This is a viewer who has four 15 foot tall Taylor uh, junipers and uh, they're trying to protect them from an unknown varmint. <laughs> they suspect squirrels, they find the branches broken off and lying on the ground, and, and then of course they're misshapen like that. Right. They've tried squirrel spray, reflective tape, wind chimes, a plastic owl with a spinning head, netting wrap, and a lack of water availability. Yeah, so all those things wouldn't work, even if it is squirrels. The funny part, thinking a squirrel, it looks like they're all on the same side of the tree. Mm -hmm. which kind of preludes why would a squirrel do that? And if you don't have any big deciduous trees where a squirrel can make a nest, I don't, I know I've seen them 
you know, harvest twigs off of junipers, but all on one side and that, all about the same height, it just is not normal behavior for a squirrel. So I would look at those branches, maybe it's a, an insect or something occurring in the very cold side or hot side, because they usually take them very random and not all in one area on, on any kind of tree. So um, it's, it, it's a little bit of a quandary for me. The way they're like bites about the same height on the same side just precludes most squirrel behavior. That is weird, it's almost like somebody stood on a ladder and <clears throat> yeah, or it, but like if it that. was an insect that wanted to be in the warmth or the cool or a disease that's always on the sunny side, then you may get that. I don't know. Very strange. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Sarah, you're up next. This is a Lincoln viewer. Uh, interesting question for this one. She's grown thornless blackberries for years. One year they were loaded. Wood ashes. She read would benefit it, um, and they never produced again. And then after she did that, she discovered her husband had burned all kinds of scrap wood, some with finishes and rags, and then put those ashes on the blackberries. She's wondered if that poisoned the soil. They removed the plants, tilled it well, replanted the area with volunteers, seemed to be doing okay, but now the originals have sent underground roots and they pop up five feet away. They seldom produce berries. So they're wondering, is it a non-productive rootstock, not enough nutrients, any hope on this, or should she just cut them out, dig them up, start over with something that she knows is a name variety? So wood ashes in general are not a great soil amendment uh, because they contain a lot of salts. And so you can, um, uh, you can cause a, a, a raise in the salinity of the soil. You know, but it depends on how many ashes he applied. If we're talking about several wheelbarrows full, you know, that's, that's not great. That's pretty bad. But if we're talking about like a five gallon bucket, then that's not too horrible. Um, so, I mean, just keep that in mind with wood ashes in the future. Um, it's normal for, for black raspberries to send up suckers and they can come up quite a distance from the original plant. Um, my concern is that if you collected these plants as volunteers, you know, they're, uh, black raspberries and blackberries are both susceptible to some viruses and some other diseases. So it could have been that the plants that you dug, dug up were actually diseased plants, and that's why they're not doing well, you know, and, and producing. So I guess what I would do uh, this spring is to watch the plants and see if they bloom. And if they bloom, do those flowers actually develop into fruits or do the flowers dry up and die? Um, those might give some indications on what is actually happening with these plants. But um, if, they, if they do have a virus or some other kind of disease, then you're just gonna have to get rid of these and put, put in new fresh plants that are healthy and don't have any kind of diseases on them. All right, thanks, Sarah. Um, this one with three pictures comes to us from Chandler, Arizona. They're wondering what kind of tree this is and if it's too far gone and just needs to be removed. And uh, it kind of looks ash-like and there would be some ashes that are hardy in that part of the country. But you, I think they've sent us a, a full picture, a, a tr trunk picture, and then maybe another one in there with disease on it. It does look somewhat like an ash, although I can't be 100% positive just from the pictures. The bark doesn't look quite like an ash, but but uh, aside from that, that trunk wound is pretty serious. And obviously the tree is having trouble moving enough water and that's why you're getting the scorching of the leaflets as we can see in this picture. So um, either you need to step up the watering and try to provide this tree with more moisture um, so that even despite that trunk injury, it would be able to move enough water to keep the tree healthy and the leaves vigorous. Uh, but this is, again, this is a pretty significant wound. Uh, and you actually have a codominant uh, branches there coming out from that, uh, that first junction of the tree, which is not a strong junction. So I don't know, this tree may be important to you because it provides some shade and it's, it's obviously an older, well-established tree, uh, but I would start planting another tree to take its place. All right, thank you, Sarah. Well, you know, good gardeners know that having good soil is critical to growing those plants the right way. For our first feature tonight, Jeff Culbertson will give us some great tips on getting your soil ready for the growing season.
Well, if you're like me, you're ready to get outside and start prepping your planting beds for this coming year. So we're about a month out from planting right now, so this is the ideal time to get out and uh, locate the area you want to plant in and prepare the soil for your annuals or your vegetables that you're going to put in them for this, for this summer. So the first thing you want to do is try to locate an area that really is in full sun. You don't want to have too much in the way of possible shade from a tree or from a building. So most of our annual flowers and our vegetables are going to prefer a full sun site. The next stage is clearing the site. So if it's, if it's a lawn area, then you're going to scrape away the grass and I would just go ahead and compost that. We don't want to incorporate that into our soil. If it's a mulch bed like this, pull away as much mulch as possible. Again, we don't want to incorporate mulch into the soil. It will rob nitrogen from the soil initially. Once we have that done, then we'll go ahead and get some compost. Uh, we'll put down, oh, two to three inches of compost on top and then dig that in. And you can use a small tiller perhaps, or today we're going to use a, a fork, a garden fork to go ahead and, and incorporate that into the soil. So if you have an existing garden site, you'll want to, like we've done here, pull the mulch back. And in a case like this, to avoid bringing up some of the weed seeds that may be down in the soil, we'll spread compost over to the top of a site like this, rake it in, and not uh, dig it in to the soil. That way, ideally, we avoid some of the weeds that may come up later in the year. If you're gonna apply a fertilizer to the bed, then you're, you'll look at the, what the plants require, so do a little research on that. You'll also wanna look at the product you're gonna apply, look at the label there to see how much to put out. So when we fertilize, we'll use, a, we'll use one pound per 100 square feet of a balanced fertilizer, a 10% nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, 10% potassium fertilizer, uh, spread evenly through the bed, and then incorporate that as well into the bed. A third thing to think about is if you have, if you're gonna to need to walk through the bed, once you have the bed prepped, perhaps mulch those paths so you don't compact the soil through the year as you're working in the garden. So when we prep our bed, we wanna make sure that we remove any lawn or mulch before we do uh, any incorporating into the bed. We wanna make sure we add a couple inches of compost to it. Um, and then we wanna avoid over-tilling the soil Make sure that we, we work it in, but we don't overdo it. We don't want to damage the soil structure too much. Thank you, Jeff. And remember, you can see all these principles put into action out in the backyard farmer garden. Keep your boots off our soil. <laughs> all right, uh, Kyle, your next one is three pictures. This is a Lincoln viewer. They have a large hedge of winter creeper that has climbed their chain link fence. It's really good for screening the neighboring properties, but this is what they found on it over the weekend. They want to know what is it? Is there anything to do about it? And will it spread to other plants? Yes, um, well, these are caskins um, of probably a plant hopper. So um, insects, they have an exoskeleton, a hard shell, and as they grow, the immatures, they have to shed that to, uh, to grow, so they, that's what, what you're looking at there, that's just the molt or, or shed skin of, of a, probably a plant hopper based on the filaments around it. Um, I, there's only a couple of them, so even if they do spread to something else, it's not anything I would be worried about. So it's not the dreaded scale on Euonymus, at least? No, okay. nope. All right, excellent. Uh, you have one picture on this next one. This is a viewer we're not sure where from. <clears throat> They're saying they had the hoses rolled up in the garage and the sprinklers were sitting on a shelf. Hooked up the sprinkler, no water came out, took the hose off to reattach it. It was totally full, that little screen thing, um, with ants. And the question here is why do they try to nest in the ends of a sprinkler or a hose and what can you do about that? Yeah. I have, I have no idea. This is bizarre. Um, <laughs> I, I'm stumped on this one. So yeah, I, I guess um, why they would be in there, I couldn't really tell you. You might, you might be able to just, if you kind of lay it out in the sun, get them out. Um, otherwise, I guess what you could do is just get a new hose. <laughs> well, they, but I mean, ants don't normally 
put their eggs and things in a spot like that, do they? Yeah, um, not normally, but I, it did look like there was either some eggs or pupae in there too, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Or larvae, yeah. Really odd. Yeah. All right, excellent. <clears throat> kind of a they wanted one to go for a swim. <laughs> I guess. We've never had that question before, I don't think. All right, Matt, uh, this is an Omaha viewer, and they're saying that... Uh, their backyard of the house that they bought uh, has uneven grass and it's bumpy and uneven because the former owners had chickens mm. and the chickens apparently bumped and lumped their grass. So I think we have maybe two picks on this. They, they kind of both look like that. Mm. They're wondering what they can do to actually restore real turf to yeah. this. Yeah, depending on what type of grass it is, if it's mostly tall fescue and rye grass, then those clumps won't really spread. So fertilizer, if it's bluegrass, would probably help spread that grass out and take care of some of that clump. Uh, but if you want to start over, you'd have, probably have to till the area. Uh, the other option would be to bring in some soil, level it off and reseed, um, probably a little bit of bluegrass with whatever else is in that lawn. And that would help just try and remediate some of those bumps. Um, the other option would be to heavily aerify it and punch a bunch of holes, bring up a bunch of soil, and then seed into that. And hopefully over time with a little bit of fertilizer and water, you can get that to- Declump. Declump, And yeah. don't buy any more chickens. Yeah, I expose now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you have one picture on the next one. This is a Raymond viewer uh, and could be many, many. When can henbit be treated and what would you kill it with? When can you plant grass in its place? Okay, so yeah, henbit is probably getting to the point to where treatment is not gonna work very well because once it flowers and it matures, uh, herbicides don't work as well. So you wanna catch it when it's young. It is a winter annual, so the ideal time would be in the fall and you can control it really easily. Uh, once we get into warmer days like we're having this weekend, uh, henbit kind of checks out, it's already flowering and seeding. So if we spray it, uh, the end is near, uh, it does come out fairly easily. So if there's not a lot of it, pulling it. Um, and if you do have to treat it, most of the broadleaf herbicides work. Uh, but ones that contain, let's say, a hotter active like carfentrazone or sulfentrazone in them, will burn it down quicker because it's, it's not very prone to burning back with 2,4-D very fast. So it's a slow process. Um, if you do use a 2,4-D product, I think it's about six weeks before you can reseed. All so. right, thank you, Matt. Uh, let's see, Dennis, you have three that are, two are very related, but your first one, two pictures. This comes to us from Ashland. She wants to know what animal is digging these holes. She's had an increase this year. Yeah, so this is either a Franklin ground squirrel, or if you're near any kind of farmstead, it could be a rat. But an open hole like this that it looks like, I can't see from that ruler exactly what the marks are, um, but if it's less than five inches. Eight it's, inches, it's eight. It's eight? Yeah. Oh, if it's eight, then it's a woodchuck. Okay. That's a woodchuck. Who would chuck that wood? And yep, well they don't chuck wood, they dig holes. <laughs> okay, a woodchuck. All right, you yeah. have two picks on the next one. Uh, this is uh, under an ash tree in Palmyra. Whole yard is being taken over. The yard is a bumpy mess. They think it looks like worm castings. Well, it could be, but the way it's really fluffed up, I think it may be birds after worms. Um, and so this time of year, birds, robins, uh, starlings are all after anything in the grass. And if we had a little bit of rain, worms would come up and then that'd be a buffet. The other thing is, especially robins right now are building nests to lay their eggs and they like a lot of little mud and grass to make that nest, it makes for a nice home. Um, so they'd be picking and not only getting worms but also getting material to build with. All right, and then two more and it's, this is uh, Lincoln viewer, maybe the same thing, the soil stayed level, no moles, voles, tunnels, yeah. kind of the same thing. Do you this think? looks more like true earthworm yeah. okay. uh, castings. Not as much the birds and earthworms, but almost earthworm castings, which is good for the soil, makes it bumpy, but uh, you slip less when you're running on the lawn when it has bumps. <laughs> or you catch your toe and you face plant. Yeah, that's okay too. Okay, all right. Sarah, um, you have on this one uh, three pictures. This is tomatoes started from seed. 
This is, and they've done it for years. They've never really seen the curl. They wonder if there's a problem or is it grow light burn? Um, they're as tall as the lights. They did lift the lights. And then you, I think you have another picture from a different viewer, which is basically almost the same thing. Leaves are curling spots on the leaves. The first is from Underwood, Iowa. This first three pictures and the, the second is from Omaha. The second question. Um, I would I would not say that this looks like a light burn to me. Um, there were some strange spots on the leaves, and there are some areas where the veins on the underside of the leaves were uh, strangely formed. They were kind of rough and and thickened on, in a really unusual way. And unfortunately, I can't really say what this is. I, I can't. Have, I don't think I've ever seen this before. So this might be a good sample if you want to submit one to uh, Kyle at the Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic. I'm wondering, if, especially the first viewer, I'm wondering where they got the seed from. If this is seed that they have saved from other plants, um, in that case, again, there could be, uh, there could have been a disease on those plants uh, that you, where you saved the seed, and this could be a, some expression of some kind of a virus. Um, not, not uh, totally 100% sure. Right. So I would send a sample into Kyle. All right, and then your, uh, your, your last one, the Omaha one. She again, she just sent kind of. A couple pictures, but they look, they all look like this. She's wondering what she's doing wrong. Yeah, you know, it's really hard to say without knowing, you know, what's your fertility, what's your watering, what, you know, all, all of those details of production. My first thought looking at this is that you have a fertility problem and maybe they haven't gotten enough uh, nutrients. All right, thank you, Sarah. Well, before we go to break, we're going to hear a little bit about the upcoming weather for the week. Let's take a minute to hear from Gannon Rush from UNL's High Plains Regional Climate Center on what to expect. Thanks, Kim. I hope everyone had a great week and enjoyed the nice weather. As I had briefly mentioned last week, we're expecting a bit of a warm up to occur, and that will start on Saturday. Temperatures will rise into the mid upper 80s and will stay that way through Monday, after which things will cool, cool off across the state, dropping into the upper 50s into the low 60s. Also on Monday, we're expecting a system to move through the state and with it precipitation occurring. The highest amounts are expected across the eastern portion of the state where strong to significant thunderstorms could occur. Out west, we're expecting a combination of rain and snow, and it could be a little slushy. Soil temperatures across the state are still relatively mild, in the upper 40s into the low 50s. They will likely warm up this week, thanks to the warm up we're having, before they fall again due to the cool down. And that's your weekly weather forecast. Back to you, Kim. Thank you. And of course, right now it's time for the lightning round. Sarah, the hot seat. All right. All right. This is a Humboldt viewer. She says they are now in zone 6B, not 5B. She wonders whether she can plant her flower seeds outdoors a week earlier than normal. No, I would not do that um, because we still get those average late frosts, uh, even though you're now in a new zone and it'll, it'll zap your plants if you do. All right, uh, this is a Louisville viewer who wants to know whether she can grow black diamond watermelons and have them come up seedless. No, black diamond is not a seedless cultivar, so no, that won't happen. All right. Um, this is a fireplace wood ashes question again. They they want to know is there a safe like fireplace wood ash charcoal lighter no. matches? No, charcoal is worse than wood ash. It's just the amount. You know how much you're adding to how large of an area of soil. So. Use it sparingly. All right. Uh, we have a viewer who is uh, planting a new strawberry bed. They want to know, can they uh, use preen after planting to keep the weeds down? Uh, as long as strawberries are on the preen label, which I believe they are, but double check. All right. Nice job. Thank you. OK, Dennis. I'm ready. OK, here we go. This says, uh, this could have been from multiple viewers, but this Lincoln viewer said the foxes have made a den in their mulch pile. When will they see the kits? Well, depends if it's a male or female. If it's a female, you'll probably start to see them in a week or two. All right. Uh, we have an Underwood, Iowa viewer again who wonders whether castor oil really works to get rid of moles. Not really. Um, it, it helps repel them, but very, very short amount of time. All right. This is a Grand Island viewer who wonders, is there any way at all to keep squirrels from digging in the gardens? Not really. Okay. Uh, 
a Kearney viewer, a Kearney area viewer said they see the prairie dog place along the interstate, but they don't see any prairie dogs. They're there. I know I, I've been there and I know the owner. All right. Um, this is a Sydney viewer who wonders, is there any way to help the amphibians during drought? So must be talking frogs and toads and things. Not really. Uh, we just have to hope for water like everybody else. They're pretty resilient. Okay, awesome, nice job. Okay, Matt, ready? Yeah, as long as you have six questions. I do. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't mean you're gonna be able to answer them all. <laughs> All right, this is a Norfolk viewer who wonders about the, the timing for putting on the turf triple action three-way product pre-herbicide and fertilizer. Is it now or is it later? Uh, depending on what you're after. If you have broadleafs in the area, you could use it now. But if you don't, I'd wait a little bit longer or get it closer to that crabgrass emergence. All right. Um, this is a viewer who wants to know whether they can use micro clover and then one of the fescues, like creeping or sheep's fescue, in dry shade without irrigation. Uh, if you can get it established, I think they'll probably go together and the clover will feed the grass. All right. This is a York viewer who said they seeded annual rye last fall and they just want to know if they can seed right into it. You should be able to. The annual rye will continue to grow throughout the year, but you can mow it off. All right. Uh, this is a Firth viewer who wants to know when to overseed fescue. Is there a soil temperature that we look for? Uh, I would overseed anytime you can when it's not too wet. It'll grow when it can. All right. Is there a time to kill flowering dandelions that works? Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> if they're flowering and you spray them, it will eventually kill the plant, but sometimes it takes a little longer when they're flowering and putting all that effort to push it out. All right, thanks. <laughs> okay, Kyle, you ready? Oh, yeah, I'm ready. All right, this is a Carney viewer who sent in this question, and there were three excl exclamation points on it. Ticks, is there any spray or preventative? The ticks are out already. Um, like for yourself, yeah, there are some, some sprays, like I believe it's permethrin that you can apply to, um, to clothing that, um, it, it can even last through several washes, but, um, yeah, otherwise I don't know that, that, uh, just normal repellent works. All right. Um, this is an Omaha viewer who says bumblebees were allowed to overwinter where a tree and a stump were removed and now they want to persuade the bees to move. Is there a way to do that? Um, <clears throat> bumblebees or, or they honey? Said, they said bumbles. Um, I you don't, pass. yeah, I, I'll pass. I, <laughs> Who knows on that yeah. one, right? Um, earthworms are taking over the yard on the, of this viewer. What to do? Oh, pass. Go fishing. Yeah. Teeny ants in the kitchen. Is there a way to tell if they're grease ants or sugar ants? Um, put out bait and, and see what they like to eat. Um, I would start with like a, a sugar bait. Um, that's most common that what you're gonna see in, in kitchens, I think. Um, if they're not going to that, that sugar bait, then, then it's a yeah, grease bait. I'd switch it up, yeah. Perfect, nice, nice job all. Well, you know, we are anxious to get plants going in our garden this season, but obviously we haven't planted much yet. Terry says there's plenty going on in the greenhouse in prep. So let's see what's going on for the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we are continually working in the greenhouse. We still have several plants that need to be planted, seeded, those kinds of things bumped up. So the greenhouse is still steady, but we are moving out into the landscape. As you can see, we have put a brand new trellis up on one of our ra new raised beds from last year. It's looking great. We have three more to install. Word to the wise, if you are adding a trellis, maybe think about that before you put all the soil in because our beds, we have to remove the soil to put the trellis up and then put the soil back in. So a little bit of work, but I think it's gonna look great. We are slowly cleaning up our beds. We'll be making sure all the leaves are out, taking down some of those suffertescent plants and making our garden look beautiful. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden this week and check it out.
You know, it's fun to see how those beautiful plants get started, and in a few short weeks, we'll have them out in the sun to get hardened off before we plant. Now, of course, it is time for us to check out the plants of the week. Sarah, you're up. So we've got um, two really pretty plants here. This, this one in the front uh, with the small white flowers is called pearl bush. And this is actually a cultivar called snow day surprise pearl bush. So pearl bush is, um, uh, it's one of those plants that has kind of been out of fashion for a while, but seems to be making sort of a comeback. And um, it gets its name from, if you can see the, how tight those buds are, they're almost like little pearls on the plant uh, before they open. So uh, pearl bush, will, this one, Snow Day Surprise, will get to be about four feet tall or so and, and eventually be about the same width. Um, uh, need some watering when you're getting it established, but after that it can be uh, have some drought, drought tolerance. Um, so a nice, you know, pretty spring bloomer uh, that could add some color to the spring garden. Then in back of that, we have an apple. So uh, this is actually a fruiting apple um, and it was developed in Michigan. So this apple has a really, go really good cold hardiness. This one is called Zestar and it's one of the earlier uh, harvesting apples. So this will be, you know, start off the apple harvesting season. The apples themselves are a really bright red uh, and they have a nice, uh, crunchy texture to them. They're great for fresh eating, which is probably their best use, but they can also be used in uh, cooking and baking. They also have a really long storage time. So sometimes these apples can store up to two months. So if you're looking for a new little apple that you want to maybe add to your home orchard, you might want to check out Zestar. Thank you, Sarah. And they're a beautiful in blossom anyway. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, first two picks for you, Kyle. Uh, these come to us uh, dug up when they were tilling the ground in Wahoo. I just want to know what this interesting, strange insect is. It's, it's a mole cricket. So um, <clears throat> the, the immatures, they feed on, on like roots of, of plants. Um, in, in southeastern US, they can be um, a, a pretty significant pest of, uh, of turf, but here in, in Nebraska, they're not a problem. All right, nice. You have two on the next one also. This is a Bradshaw viewer. Uh, he saw a butterfly bigger than a painted lady, smaller than a monarch. Is that possible? Marked a little bit like a monarch with darker on the wingtips. And this might be what he saw. Yeah, um, this, this is a red admiral. So it's, it's very closely related to painted ladies. Um, <clears throat> and they, they overwinter in the southern US and they're kind of one of the earlier ones to migrate up to, to Nebraska, so. All right, lovely. Okay, you have three on this next one, Matt. Right. This is uh, an Omaha viewer. He uh, had a blue spruce removed in full sun. He did seed it with um, some a seed mix, got seeds mix. It was later in the year, he put down some annual seed. Now he's got some undesirable grass in the area, too large to dig. Uh, he doesn't want to use Roundup because he also still has a lot of good grass. And he also applied a second round of fertilizer with a pre in it this week. So he wonders when he can put down more seed or does he have to wait? So that's actually the mix he used. So yeah, the, I think your, the grass that you have there will probably be okay with fertilizer. If you did put a pre down, uh, the only way to really seed into it is probably to aerify and get the seed below that layer, and a lot of that seed will still make it. Um, I think that the grass that's in there that you don't want, it looks like it could be just an annual ryegrass. So I don't know if there was some of that put in there mm -hmm. uh, in the fall as well. Yep. So that will continue to grow, out throughout, or grow throughout the year, but you can mow it off or you can wait for that to grow taller and wipe it with Roundup. And that would be one way to get rid of it because it'll grow a lot faster than the rest of the grass. So it sticks up really high. Uh, that way you don't kill the, the lower grass and that'd be one way to get rid of it. Otherwise it should check out and die as the summer comes along. All right, uh, you have one picture from this next one. Uh, she says crabgrass is taking over the flower garden, growing all around several flowers, including the iris. This is the picture she sent, so is this crabgrass and she wants to know how to kill the grass without killing all of the perennials. Okay, yeah, it's it's not crabgrass because it's way too early for that, uh, but it does look like quackgrass and that's one that greens up really quick in the spring and it grows really aggressively underground rhizomes. 
Um, so killing that in a landscape bed, if you don't have other grasses, there's one product, uh, weed, uh, Grass Be Gone, is made by Ortho, and that one kills grass only. So it has a label that's safe for a lot of ornamentals, so you gotta read through that. Uh, but the active ingredient, Fluazifop, which is a fun one to say, <laughs> uh, that one kills only grass, so you can use that one. All right, thank you, Matt. Okay, uh, Dennis, let's see. Your first one is just one picture. You're gonna be so happy. This is a Lincoln viewer. Yeah. Uh, wants to know what this snake is. She thinks it's a brown snake. It is, it decays brown snake. It's full grown at eight to 10 inches and it's very cold tolerant. They come out early. They eat um, snails and slugs. So they're a good guy. Put it next to those hostas. And yeah, <laughs> eat they those. love snails and slugs. Uh, all right. You have two on the next one, Dennis. Uh, this is an Exarban neighborhood uh, in Omaha viewer. Mm -hmm. This is scat he's never seen on the property. Uh, and I think there are two pictures of it. They're just curious as are some neighbors, so. Yeah, so that one there, because it's straight and pointed one end, the second picture looks like that possibly. But the other curly one without a, with a blunt ends looks more like a avian, uh, some kind of bird. And I also see a little white on the cast on one end, so it could be the uric acid. So I don't think, you know, it's hard to tell unless they're right in front of me, but one looks like bat and one looks like avian or bird. And, and it would be ideal if maybe they had put a quarter or something Yeah, to see to the it. size or magnify it some more, yeah. All right, thank you, Dennis. Um, let's see, Sarah, your first one here is Oh dear, this is uh, the third tree planted in this location on the northwest corner of the house. It was planted a year and a half ago. The top died. He uh, thought you could redirect these weeping branches upwards. They don't seem to be growing up. And if they remove the support straps, it's gonna droop. Uh, this is Elkhorn. So they're wondering, should they cut off the dead? Should they, is there any hope for this technique working? They've watered and fertilized. Any, any ideas on A, this is the third tree in this place, and B, mm -hmm. can, this, can this beast be saved and turned into something? So when you're growing a drooping tree like this in production, they have to stake the trunks to have a central leader that will grow up because the tree doesn't want to grow that way. So um, you're either going to have to keep that leader uh, uh, pulled up into an upright position to get it to grow that way, um, and so you can either leave the dead top to do that, or you can install a, a support uh, to the trunk to, um, to tie that upright shoot to, to get it to continue to grow up. Um, so why you've lost three trees in this location, you know, I would look at watering. Um, you know, has, has it been way too dry or way too wet? Um, or has there been, it's weird if the other trees had just that top shoot die the way that this one has done, um, then uh, that's a little odd. You know, if you're going to take that top, that dead shoot off, I would check to see if there's been any tunneling in that stem or if any damage or anything that would indicate what might have caused that to die. All right. Thanks, Sarah. You have two questions for this uh, next one. She has uh, limelight hydrangeas and they're still young, obviously not any pruning. She, uh, I think she knows she needs to prune these now. Can she prune them really hard? So limelight has very large flower heads. And if the, the problem uh, is that the flower heads are getting so big that they droop down, then no, you don't want to prune it hard. And you don't prune this in the same way that you do in Annabelle, where you cut it all the way to the ground. Because what'll, what'll happen is you'll get a bunch of stems and they'll have very, very large flower heads. And then they, they will certainly droop. So you don't want to prune off more than about 20% or 25% of the stems at one time. Uh, make sure that you're pruning, you know, to buds that are going to go upward and outward. And uh, make sure that you're not over fertilizing or over watering that would cause a lot of really fast, lush growth and could contribute to those weak stems that wouldn't hold those flowers up. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Well, when the weather warms up, a lot of people get in a huge rush to get their pre-emergent down on the lawn. Let's hear from Matt for a few minutes to tell us the proper timing and other techniques to get that job done right. Spring's around the corner and you might be thinking about pre-emergent herbicides, or you might have thought about them already when we had that warm spell. 
Uh, some tips to control what we're after is generally looking at, you know, timing our pre-emergent herbicide with crabgrass. So if we're doing it really early, let's say when we, we warmed up about a week or two ago, we don't really need to put it down that early, but it's not gonna hurt the pre-emergent to sit there. As long as we got it watered in, it's not gonna do much until we warm up and then it's gonna be active for crabgrass. Uh, if, if you're wanting to get a longer season out of your pre-emergent control, when you get it closer to crabgrass emergence, it's obviously gonna last longer throughout the season. So a couple tips to go through is, you know, try and get it as close to crabgrass emergence as you can, if that's your target. If you're trying to time your application on soil temperatures, what I go by is the four inch depth. If you get to 50 degrees average throughout the day for five days, that's generally when crabgrass will start emerging. And also get it watered in as soon as you can. If you're using a sprayable product, make sure you get that watered in within 24 hours. A granular product, you have a lot more leeway because that product falls down below the grass and does a lot better. Uh, so make sure those get watered in. And if you have hot spots along sidewalks, those might be areas that you want to hit first. Um, and then come back later in those areas with the split application. If you have a nice healthy lawn, it's generally not going to be crabgrass infested because the lawn is going to outcompete the crabgrass and usually one application at the higher label rate will get you through the season. Hopefully this will help you keep that crabgrass from taking over your lawn this year. Right now, let's take a couple minutes to tell you about an announcement that we have coming up in the gardening world. Send us to us, we'll get them on. May Museum's 25th Annual Perennial Plant Sale is Saturday, May 4th, 9 to 12, in Fremont with a rain date. So that'll be a lot of fun for people. All right, Kyle, last set of questions. Uh, this two pictures on the first one. Live on a farm outside of Prague. Notice the sap leaking down the trunks of the white pines, otherwise they look healthy. What do we think is going on? Probably, um, I think in the, the next image you can really see it, probably Zimmerman pine moth. Um, the location's a little bit unusual for that, but that's probably the best bet. So if, if you can reach in those areas, sometimes you can go in with like a coat hanger or something, a wire hanger, and um, just behind that pitch mass try to, to destroy those larvae, otherwise um, they should be coming out, the, the caterpillars uh, over winter and cocoons, they would be coming out about now. So this would be a good time to treat with a pyrethroid insecticide spraying the trunk. Um, otherwise there's a second window like in August, but this period is really the more effective time to treat. Great, all right, uh, two pictures on the next one. This is a uh, papillion viewer with strange things hanging from a redbud branch. Yeah, this one has me stumped a little bit. It looks like an egg sac. Um, right. So some spiders make some really interesting egg sacs, so I'm guessing that this is a spider of, of some sort, but I, I don't, I've never seen one like that. It's way cool and weird. All right, uh, then we have uh, two pics on this next one. There was only one of these insects dead on the windowsill about three months after returning to the house after it was closed up. Good guy, bad guy, this is from Central. Nebraska. Um, nah, not necessarily a good guy. I think this is um, a, a deer fly that's missing its head. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the 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 larvae are like in kind of wet soil um, along you know water edges and that, those sorts of areas, and they are predatory, so that's good. But um, the adults, of course, take blood meals from from people, uh, vertebrates, including humans. So not the best. But <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, Matt, this is a plasma fewer. They say too much of this has come up in the yard to pull. Anything they can use to get rid of it? So yeah, this, this one looks like nimble will. Um, and it's a warm season, so it's gonna be the last or later to green up. And by the looks of it, it looks like it's starting to green up already. Mm -hmm. um, the timing for this one is probably in the next week or two and it's greened up. Uh, Tenacity is one product that can take it out selectively, but it takes three applications, so if you research that product, uh, it does pop up with nimble wool control. The other option is glyphosate and you have to spray the area because it looks like that's the only grass that's in there. So maybe that's the easier option is spray that, wait for some regrowth. If it, you give it two or three weeks, spray it again and then seed in a new variety. All right, thanks Matt. You have two picks on the next one. Um, two different plants. The first one, this one is very prolific, spreads underground, thorns, semi-woody. What do we think on this one? Uh, I had to ask uh, Kim for this one actually a little bit because I could not find what yeah. this would be and we were thinking maybe it's goji berry 
which can spread pretty easily underground and kind of has some thorns on it. So it would need a sample to make sure on that one. Um, and, and then the, the second, second one, one is they, they're just curious about this second one. Same viewer, the leaves caught their eye. Uh, I think this one is white avens. It's a mm -hmm. perennial that's uh, native to pretty much the whole eastern half of the United States. Uh, and then it doesn't always flower. Let's say it's this stage, it might be for a year and then the next year it might flower. Uh, but it's, it's not a bad plant and you can leave it around and watch it. And if you don't like it, then get rid of it. Okay, all right. Uh, Dennis, you have uh, the first one here is, they saw these things that were in their backyard and they're not sure what it is. Bring it on. It's a ball. <laughs> As you can see, they're a small little creature, and what, under snow cover, what these guys did is they eat the very bottom of the grass, and usually after the snow cover's gone, you still see those traces, but once the grass is growing, these guys um, go into the garden and dig some holes. They're a granivore. Again, short tail, not really beady eyes, can't see their ears, so they're kind of like a mouse, but again, uh, that's caused by voles. And how do you get rid of those? Well, you can use a multi-catch trap such as this. Just put this down near where you have their holes. You wind it up. On this side is a place to wind it up. This will hold 15 of them. Usually you catch them overnight. They are still alive in the morning. And then you can do what you want with them um, after you have them. Um, and again, just these multi-catch traps. Go online. Ask, um, look for multi-catch traps, um, and you can buy them at several locations, and there's several different types of multi-catch traps. Excellent. One pick on the next one. Uh, this is an Omaha viewer. It's kind of a, a not clear. What do we yeah. think is doing this? That could be a vole, but it's so hard to see. Um, I'm going to default to probably a vole. All right. Uh, just a couple questions for the last one about the turtles at Kime. How did they get to be so big? Well, they're a large species. They're not a native species. That's why they're at Kime. They're both red ear sliders and yellow belly sliders. Um, same species, different subspecies, and they were released pets. And so they're much larger than our native red ear slider. That's only in Richardson and Nemaha County. And don't release pets. They just cause havoc. Right. And that's what these are, release pets. Thank you, Dennis. Sarah, we're almost out of time, but you have some quick ones here. This is an At Atkinson, Nebraska viewer wondering, did lightning cause this damage on the west side? And then, of course, we've got bark flying all over the place. Yes, most likely. It looks like lightning damage. All right. Don't let it fall on the house, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, your second one here is an autumn blaze maple, nice and healthy, except maybe a circling root. Can they fix it? This is a Lincoln viewer. No, you can't fix it. I mean, you can cut that root, but you've already got compression of the trunk on that side of the tree and it won't expand like a balloon. It won't fill back out again. Um, it all, I'm also suspicious there might be some additional girdling roots underneath as well because there's another root going off to the side that's deeper that looks like it might also be circling. Um, so you're kind of between a rock and a hard place. You can cut this off and prevent additional compression, but it's not gonna really fix the tree. Yeah, it looks a little deep too. And this is a, a strawberry bed question. We'll just do one real quick one on this. Do they thin the strawberries in this bed? Because we have about 15 seconds. And we strawberries can should have been again. thinned right after harvest or in the fall. And you want to thin them to about five to seven per square foot. So that would be a lot of strawberries in that bed. They can be replanted though, right? Pick up the um, daughters and move them? Usually, you, nah. yeah. again, you want to make sure that they're not diseased.